Western society, and particularly its artists, has always had a fascination with the East, or as it was called in the 19th century, the Orient. From the Odalisque of Ang to the tiger and lion hunting scenes of Delacroix from the past century, to the investigations of light and color by Clay and Matisse in this century, the Middle East, and particularly North Africa, have been sources of inspiration and revelation for many Western artists. It is with great pleasure and excitement that the Bronx Museum introduces to a Western and American audience the art of a native North African, specifically a Moroccan painter, Mohamed Malehi. I am particularly doubly blessed because I have had the opportunity to work with Malehi and also to travel with him along with a film crew to his native Morocco to study his painting and to gain a greater understanding of his paintings in a wider context of both Moroccan and Islamic art and culture. Malehi has devoted a good part of his life to what he calls integrated art, that is art which has a specific function and resides within a specific context. For example, he is involved with the decoration, both ceiling and wall decorations of public spaces such as banks, post offices, and also the living rooms of private patrons. This practice and this concept has a rich tradition in the Moroccan and Islamic culture. And as we'll see, we will travel to beautiful small, small mosques situated in the mountains. We will travel to near Saharan territories where we'll investigate vernacular architecture as well as vernacular design. And we will also travel to the big city and investigate both historically and contemporary examples of official architecture and official decoration. But there is another aspect to Malehi, and that is Malehi the painter. Uh, painting as we understand it in the West here as a portable object that can be moved from one position to another. The images in Malahi's paintings are rich and varied. One recurring motif though is the wave. It appears in his commissions, both private and public, and also in his private paintings. The wave, as we understand it, as we see it in different manifestations, carries with it a rich symbolic and natural connotations. But it is even richer in the context of Islamic art, for it has a history which goes back, back for many centuries and carries with it an import, an excitement, and a mysticism which is conveyed to its audience in this present day situation by Malehi. We also see in Malehi's most recent work many references to the astrological signs the moon, the crescent, the stars. So in a way, whereas painting has traditionally been, at least in, in the 19th century, a picture to the world, Malehi's most recent works are a picture to the mind and to the imagination. I think that the work of Mohammed Malehi takes on more significance and meaning if it's looked upon within a broader uh, social cultural context and not only of Morocco, but I think of a phenomenon that is going through, uh, one can observe throughout the third world. Uh, historically, uh, art has always been interiorized. It has been part of the daily life of everybody. Art was present in the buildings, in the houses, in the utensils, in uh, all around people. But uh, through, with time, this has evolved and we found a situation where uh, art has become exteriorized. I think uh, whereas people used to live with art, uh, they started living up to art. And art became a set, a set of criteria, both aesthetic and otherwise, that completely transformed the meaning uh, of art. This happened, of course, first in the Western society, but gradually, with the independence of third world countries, the same phenomenon began to happen. And one must say that there was almost a, a rupture, a disruption, between the traditional role of art and this new uh, function. And this is where people like Melihi come in, because 
they first went through a period where they had to get up to certain standards in terms of both the techniques and of the, even the content of their work. But gradually, uh, they started not going backward, but trying to see to what extent their work really could fit uh, with the way of life. Another aspect, I think, of Milihe's work, and probably where he has been most successful, even if this may upset him as an artist, I think he has been most successful as a pedagogue in art. In other words, he has inspired a whole set of young artists coming up in Morocco. And although our first school of artists considered it below their artistic dignity, to do, for instance, quote-unquote commercial work, to do designs for hotels, to do paintings for administrative buildings, to go into design, even industrial design. Uh, Melihi had the courage, while keeping his standards, his aesthetic standards, to go into this area, and his forms became known uh, throughout the country and even outside the country. And thereby, what he has really done is that he has revalorized he has given a new value to the uh, profession uh, of uh, the artist, both ways, because uh, he's one of the rare persons who can stand to be judged on uh, two levels. One, as an artist per se, that is in terms of the aesthetics of his work, uh, the techniques, the colors, the, uh, the way his work has evolved, but also as a professional in the sense of a designer, but a designer with great uh, artistic talent it took me a little time to find the key to understanding Millet. Uh, I think it's a key uh, to understand him both as a person and to understand his work. And this uh, may appear uh, surprising, but that key is in one word, it's humor. Uh, as all people who are very sensitive, uh, who are creative, there is always a great lag between the intensity of the creation that is going on on the one hand and the capacity to express it in words. In other words, what is going on inside the stomach, what is going inside the whole body of the person in his brain when he's creating is so intensive that uh, the capacity to express it in words or to communicate with somebody else is not as fast and therefore there is a lag. Precisely because he has this lag, there is a shortcut that he has, and that he has a very, very, very deep sense of humor. You see, I've been pushing this uh, moral attitude to the extreme, is to, to align myself on the traditional artisan. And even the location of my workshop studio is in a very popular neighborhood in Casablanca, as you may see here in the picture. I work with the radio on and the people passing in front of my studio. Some, sometimes they, they come in and they ask if we varnish tables or uh, ostensiles. <laughs> and I say, no, this is uh, a studio, that's all. And uh, they ask how much these paintings cost, what they are good for. And this relationship with the population, I mean, and my work is very, uh, important to me. I've been demystificating uh, the brush stroke, the proportion, the measurements that the painter used to do before working or while working in his canvas. I reduced my action to simple 
a very simple technique. In other words, I go straight to the canvas or to the panel, drawing the shape of the composition. Most of the time it's spontaneous, but it's always contained in a certain idea and in a certain structure or geography of the painting. This uh, brought me to employ uh, assistants, like uh, the one is working with me, Abdul Qadr Al Haraj, and also to that the technique itself would contribute in the making of the painting. It's not 100% my work, I mean my personal work. It's a work of collaboration. It's uh, very simple, as you see, I draw the, the, the image, and then I use uh, paper, I mean very cheap paper, to cover areas which I don't want to paint. Now, this is um, a forced um, procedure because I use the spray. And uh, when you spray a part in the painting, you have to cover what the other parts so you don't go on again with the color. So we cover and we have to use a sort of adhesive material so we can wash easily. But in spite of this uh, cold, if you want, cold procedure, uh, I still look for uh, poetical expression in, in the work. Colors are very flat, very frank, and this is to be in the spirit of uh, the Moroccan palette, because we in Morocco use the colors very straight, very frankly done, no uh, half tones, what they call um, the demi-ton. The colors sometimes, and most of the time, comes straight from the can. By the way, I use industrial colors, I mean car paint colors. My purpose is to get to the atmosphere in the painting, the, the, the material has no uh, importance like it's in the oil painting, where you count on the texture, on the brush stroke, and uh, all the cuisine, you know, you can work in the, in, in the canvas. In my work, there is no cuisine. <laughs> I've been observing the Moroccan uh, artisans working and they they don't make too much fuss about their techniques and works but they have something in mind I mean something that holds all this uh, business of creating art is the a certain mystical feeling the philosophy behind that i i have to say it in arabic we say al kamalu lillah it's only god who is perfect who can do perfect things but when you work when the artisan works and produces a production he's uh he in his undermind he tries to approach god being more and more excellent in his work but he never pretends to be so perfect. first people to be open to this new form of art, some architects, uh, particularly two architects with whom I worked, uh, Farawi and De Mazier from Rabat. And we happened to have the same feelings, is to uh, do and create a modern architecture or an art without losing the contact with the 
traditional morality of Moroccan art. And these two architects, for instance, they built a hotel in Marrakesh, Hotel des Almoravid, where I've done the first integrated work in ceramics. My work is mainly flat, and this goes with the spirit of Islamic art, where the depth, the perspective, I mean, the depth is kept in the mind, and the eyes has to transfer the image, the flat image, to the mind and look for a possible perspective. Here is the difference between Islamic art and uh, Occidental art, especially the Renaissance. About these mosques in the southern part of the country, in Morocco, mainly in the high Atlas Mountains, the Tarudant area, isolation of these parts has played the role of conservation or has played a role of preservation of these sites. These painted ceilings in modest and humble mosques were kept out of reach of the new uh, modern invasion. As you may observe, the architecture is very simple, made of uh, adobe, mud, and the ceilings were painted as to symbolize maybe a certain devotion to the cult place. Fortunately, this places are still kept, not because of interest, they are kept in the spirit of being forgotten. The particular thing about these paintings struck my eye because they, they, they are familiar to me because my way of painting, my uh, discourse of painting is very close to these ceilings and 
and I nev I've never seen them before. So when we saw them the first time, I, I felt concerned about this work. Maybe another painter wouldn't give any importance to this uh, realization and would consider them like any decorative work. But the important thing about this sort of writing, you know, in the absence of uh, written and fluently speaking language, these ceilings are pieces of literature. You can say from the diversity and the richness of the patterns and forms, and sometimes they speak to you, and they are, I would say, ins inspired from nature, because these artists live in a complete natural atmosphere without any contact with the modern or official civilization in the big in the urban areas. And this is the big merit of these works and uh, certain wisdom and the, the convergence between this expression and what we might find in modern art today. So we meet here again the mystical uh, feeling. And sometimes you would read a small sentence devoted to the worship of God. Well, let's go back to Asila. Asila is my hometown where I was born 48 years ago. And uh, as you may see, the, the topography of this little town on the Atlantic shore has a very simple architecture, which uh, <clears throat> sometimes it reminds me of the paintings of Nicola de Stal and also Ellsworth Kelly of the geometric volumes and space. This is the environment where I was, where I spent my childhood. You know, narrow streets and this uh, particular cemetery on the on the sea, and we live just close to it. And for my studies, I had to leave this place. And after many years, uh, I'm back. And every year in August, we organize a, a sort of festival. We call it Musim, and artists gather from all over the world to practice their art. Now, uh, this makes part of this preoccupation of uh, bringing art closer to the people and operating a sort of a demystification of culture itself. And if you happen to have an idea, you, you try it at your home first and uh, to me, Asila is a good field and a platform where I can put sometimes in practice my ideas.